Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfaris with the news from the global economy. On today's show, the Russian economy and the sanctions over the Ukraine, and in Japan, a future in which it is difficult to tell man and machine apart is moving closer to reality. First, the headlines. Stocks rose in Asia and Europe on Monday following a U.S. rally encouraged by an easing of tensions between Russia and Ukraine. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index added 1.2 percent, rebounding from losses on August 8, and the Stocks Europe 600 Index advanced 0.8 percent in early trade in London. Standard & Poor's 500 Index futures added 0.2 percent after the gauge rose the most since March. Wall Street climbed higher on Friday on news that Russia ended military exercises near Ukraine and as U.S. airstrikes in Iraq were unlikely for now. Houston billionaire Richard Kinder is consolidating his pipeline empire to strengthen it for growth as the U.S. shale drilling boom spawns new opportunities. Kinder Morgan, which runs 80,000 miles of oil and gas pipelines in North America, plans to spend $44 billion to buy out outside investors. The deal that ranks as the second largest in the energy sector aims to consolidate, cut costs, and increase profits for the lagging energy giant. It also signals a new round of deal-making for the pipeline industry, which has seen growth rocket in the past five years as the shale boom has spread across North America. Private equity group Blackstone is set to acquire Shell's stake in the Haynesville Shale Formation that rests under large parts of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. Royal Dutch Shell may sell its 50% stake in the Louisiana gas field to Blackstone for $1.2 billion as early as this week. Private equity groups have gradually turned their attention to shale with proven deposits of natural gas liquids and oil where profits are higher. The world's largest oil companies, however, have not been as successful in unlocking the, few, the full potential of North American shale and are increasingly shedding assets. Australian ASEAN foreign ministers further discussion of a regional comprehensive economic partnership at a joint ministerial meeting in Myanmar. Australia and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations are in the process of implementing a free trade agreement, including New Zealand. One of the initial projects for cooperation focuses on education. As Australia further integrates into the region, it hopes to implement the new Colombo plan encouraging student exchanges. India approved the setting up and listing of Real Estate Investment Trusts, REITs, as it seeks to unlock a $20 billion market. The Securities and Exchange Board of India said trusts would have to own assets worth at least $82 million. The REITs allow investors to participate in the country's property market without directly investing in it for as little as $3,200. The introduction of the real estate trusts provides a new source of funding for cash-strapped developers struggling to reduce debt amid skyrocketing interest rates and the lowest economic growth in a decade. As Ukraine's military leaders advance eastward, they presume Russia has too much to lose to invade, including ever-crippling international sanctions. But how long will Western leaders allow for the situation to, to escalate, and how long will Ukrainians be able to bear the economic situation? The story by Daniel Roth follows. In the pro-Russian rebel stronghold of Donetsk in Ukraine's war-torn east, residents lined up to take out cash over the weekend. The Russian suit after the National Bank of Ukraine announced that it will be shutting down its last branch in the city at the end of the weekend. I'm trying to withdraw some cash. All of the banks are closed. The National Bank has decided that only in Donetsk. Besides Donetsk, it's working. And that's the only bank where we can withdraw our salary. The city of one million has been at the center of fighting in recent days as Ukrainian government forces aim to take back strongholds. Events unfolding amid fears that there could be a Russian invasion in the guise of a humanitarian mission. Meanwhile, Russia struck back at Western sanctions by setting a ban on food products, excluding baby food, from the U.S., Canada, EU, Australia and Norway for a year. Up until now, Russia has imported 35 percent of its food, taking 10 percent of the EU's food exports, worth just over $16 billion. Indeed, tensions are high, though some Russians imagine this to be an opportunity. I'm going to miss French wine and cheese because we were used to it, as well as several products without which we can't picture our daily life. 
But on the other side, the situation is such that maybe the sanctions will be useful in some ways for our country. Our farming sector is going to develop, our market will develop. But some economists, including the head of the FBK Strategic Analysis Institute, warn the sanctions will hurt the poorest Russians, raising prices on food 20 to 30 percent, saying steep taxes over the last decade have hurt farming in Russia. The sanctions on Russia and the fighting in Ukraine are taking a major toll on economic realities as well as life. Over the past four months, the U.N. has counted more than 1,300 left dead and more than 4,000 injured. Approximately 285,000 have fled their homes. And we're joined now by Paula Slyla, Slyer, sorry, Middle East Bureau Chief and Correspondent for RT. Mrs. Slyer, thanks for joining us. So there's so many different parties involved in this conflict. I mean, on the one side you have Russia, and on the other side you have the Ukrainian military leaders, you have the separatist rebels. Um, can you give us some uh, clarity here on what's going on? I'm not sure if there are that many sides. I think you can break it down on two levels. On the one level, it is the Ukrainians that are fighting the Ukrainians. And they're those that support the Kiev government. And they're those Ukrainians who support Russia. So they're okay. often referred to as the rebels or the pro-Russians mm -hmm. or the anti-Kievs. But then on the biggest scale, you have Kiev that is supported by the European Union and the West and the United States. And then you have, in opposition, Russia. So that is why many discussions around what is happening in Ukraine center around whether it's a story just about what's happening inside Ukraine or whether it's not a bigger story about West versus Russia right. and a resumption of Cold War tensions. Exactly. Um, essentially, that's where it all stems from. Also, anyways, with Yanukovych essentially being back to being sort of in the middle between Ukraine and, uh, sorry, being Western European Union forces, so to speak, on the one hand, um, in terms of trade, and then Russia, who wants to keep, of course, uh, uh, all its allies close. Um, what's the situation right now in Donetsk? Well, Donetsk is very representative of what's happening in the east of Ukraine, yeah. and that's where a lot of the fighting has been centered. And the latest information is that Donetsk essentially is on the brink of falling. I was there recently, and it was a very different picture. The, the mood on the ground not so long ago, a few weeks ago, was that Donetsk was managing to stand its own against the Ukrainian army. But certainly what we've seen is the Ukrainian army has made advances, not only in Donetsk and Lugansk as well, in those regions right. in the east that held a referendum and want to be separated from Ukraine and actually join Russia. They, they voted that they wanted to be part of Russia. Russia hadn't officially responded whether or not it was willing to take them in right. in the same way that it took in Crimea. But certainly the, 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 the reports on the ground mm -hmm. is that these pro-Russian fighters are losing the battle and that Ukraine is managing to kind of bring itself back together. But if we're looking at this on an economic front, this war has cost billions. I mean, the latest figures we have are that it costs the Kiev government $5.2 million a day. And that is money that a cash-strapped Ukrainian population and cannot economy afford. cannot afford. Now, if we're talking about the Ukraine, on the one hand, I mean, Russia also, should, there, should, should these sanctions um, be increased and expanded? What would the effect be on Russia? And how would it basically bleed through, so to speak, to the, to the rest of the population? I think the effect is much more dire on Ukraine. And certainly the rhetoric that has come from the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, and also by analysts, is that Russia is responding by slapping its own sanctions, not only against Ukraine, but also against the West. There's talk now that Russia is also going to stop flights using its mm -hmm. airspace. Certainly it does seem as if Russia is not suffering in any way from the sanctions that have been imposed against it. Back in June, Russia stopped the export of gas to Ukraine. Now we're coming up to winter, and the predictions are that you could possibly see another revolution in Ukraine as people again take to the streets. There's not enough gas reserves. People are going to be very, very cold this winter, right. and there's a growing call on the Ukrainian street for an acknowledgement that Ukraine doesn't actually have another alternative to supplying it with gas, for example, than the Russian market. Russia has banned all the import of Ukrainian products into Russia. Mm -hmm. Russia is Ukraine's biggest market. So the Ukrainians need Russia on the level of sanctions much more than Russia needs Ukraine. But at the end of the day, as you said yourself, I mean, really, we have Europe versus um, Europe and the US versus Russia. I mean, do they really care? And to what extent do they really care about the Ukrainians? That's, I mean, a question I guess we're not necessarily going to get to here. But well, do you think that this, es this situation could escalate further? It's, it's difficult to answer because if you'd asked me a month ago if I thought eastern Ukraine and Donetsk that you referenced would 
would fall, I would have said no. I would have said that the mood on the ground and the sense I got when I was reporting there that the pro-Russians were very, very strong in their resistance to Kiev. The situation is so fluid and it's so hard to predict exactly what's going to happen. I certainly think that this is a battle not just about what's happening inside Ukraine. This is a battle in terms of the, the West versus Russia. And the Russian government has been quite firm. For them, Ukraine is very, very important. Any kind of developments in Ukraine in terms of, let's say, NATO building up its, its troops there, they take very, very seriously. It's on the Russian border. This is not a country that is miles and miles away from Russia like it is for the United States. So I think it's going to remain a hot spot in the international news for quite some time, but it's still a little bit difficult to predict exactly which direction it's going to go. Although I say the, the reports on the ground at the moment is that the Ukrainian military is winning in its battles against these pro-Russian separatists. Okay, well, we definitely hope to have you here again to give us more information regarding how it basically plays itself out. Thank you very much, Paula Slyer. Slyer sorry. <laughs> Middle East Bureau Chief and Correspondent for RT. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Recent robotic breakthroughs in Japan are raising legal and ethical issues as we enter a reality where the gap between human and robot is narrowing. More on this report. This Japanese android isn't a journalist. But during a recent photo call, the robot expressed an interest in joining the fourth state. My dream when I grow up is to be a TV presenter. If you hear of an anchor's position, please let me know. Kodomoroid and these other robots are all controlled remotely by us humans. They can read, but they can't understand. But their creator, Professor Ishiguro, feels that machines are just as good as people. So actually, you know, the Kodomoroid is reading a news. But announcers, you know, the newscaster, also the reading of news, do they have the same process to understand or different? Right? Some, some of them they may read the news as a machine, you know, without thinking anything. This robot already has a job. Pepper works front of house at a Japanese tech shop. And here, small talk is a work requisite. I thought it was going to be a one-way conversation, but there was a real dialogue. It's impressive. It's like a kid, really cute. You can really have a chat. It's amusing. All good fun and a glimpse into the future, perhaps, although this robotics expert says there are limits to what robots can achieve. In specific areas like chess or maths, computers are very strong. But current artificial intelligence technology is far from sufficient for robots to have real, natural interaction with people. Back in the store, Pepper, despite the occasional slip, creates the illusion of conversation. Sweet for some, a sign of what may lie ahead for others. And now for a look at some other news reports in Media Watch with Daniel Roth. So are you a robot? I am not a robot. I'm sure everybody is wondering that now home right now, but okay, let's move on uh, to more important <laughs> things. Singularity Hub yes. uh, picked up a story re very related to the last thing that we saw. Uh, a company called Momentum Machines uh, out west, in the, out west west in the western U.S. Uh, is working on an assembly line product uh, essentially to replace all fast food cooks. Uh, they say that it's. Uh, they say it's going to be a great idea because it's going to uh, basically save money for fast food restaurants, so that they can then buy better meats and better vegetables and serve gourmet food for the same prices as fast food. Uh, this is what they say. This is their hope. Obviously, Anything to save a buck. Right. Uh, this is probably not how it will play out. We can see that usually when companies have an ability to cut corners, that hmm. profit goes up. We can see that in statistics over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, it goes up to the owners and the board members and such. But, uh, you know, they're... 
the technology is here, and that's something that you can't contend with. And the question is, how will the transition take place? So you can't just simply have all of the line cooks. There's 3.6 million fast food workers. There's the front end and the back end. And we've already reported here on these computers that they're using to take orders. If they have computers to take orders and assembly line machines to cook, they're not going to be 3.6 million right. uh, fast food workers. There's going to be 3.6 million people looking for work. <laughs> and so the question is, how does that transition happen slowly or quickly? If it happens slowly, there's an opportunity to uh, work towards education and towards uh, shifting careers for a lot of people. Uh, if it happens quickly, you're talking about complete and total social unrest. Uh, right. 3.6 million people out of work is not an easy thing for government or industry or a population to take never, care of. Never mind the fact, of course, that, I mean, uh, what are you going to be re-educating these people to do? I mean, right. like, I was thinking in my head, you know, well, maybe you can re-educate them to actually fix these computers and robots when they break down. Right. So actually, historically, 52% uh, uh, of this survey asked uh, said, historically technology trends usually create more jobs the question is will it this time okay well we'll see about that Daniel Roth thanks for joining us that's the end of this magazine thank you very much for watching I'm Benjamin Chong of Paris thanks for watching and join us again tomorrow